Let us ask ourselves this question. What is our idea of freedom? Dwell upon it a moment. Find out exactly what freedom means to you. You may discover that your idea of freedom is quite different than the idea of freedom that the world accepts. For example, you might ask a friend of yours, not in this path, what does freedom mean to you? And some of the answers you would receive would show you the reason that we must transcend mind. For example, to the average person, freedom would be the ability to come and go as I please, not to be concerned, not to be afraid, not to be limited or lacking. And if you pursued that a little further, what the average person would mean by freedom would be basically the creature comforts of this world plus the ability to do just what that person pleases to do. And that would be their idea of freedom. They would be limiting their concept of freedom to the human mind and the human body. Whereas, the infinite mind has a completely different idea of freedom. And we as human beings, limited to our concepts of freedom, completely go about human business, not about the Father's business limiting ourselves to a finite world, a limited world, a world of good and a world of evil, a world in which there is age and a human lifespan and diseased flesh and sorrow and war and all of the evils which the human mind bears witness to. Now that human mind is a false witness misperceiving the perfect reality that is all around us. That human mind does not see God. That human mind sees things that God did not create. It does not know the identity of man of earth as son of God. It does not know its purpose in this world or the direction it should follow. It is separated from the infinite mind. It has two powers, a power other than the infinite power. And by virtue of this separation, and its acceptance of powers other than the one, it bears witness to a world that God did not create. And so we finally walk in a form which is subject to this mind, a form that we learn is not the form that God created is not the divine image and likeness, but rather is the mortal mind image and likeness. And it picks up things from the atmosphere around us. And then it externalizes these things 
as the sins, the crimes, the lacks, the limitations and diseases, and thinks that discord is coming to my body. Never aware that discord can never come to my body, but that mortal mind accepted in me is the father of the discords of this image body. And so we're told to transcend that mind. Transcend the human concept of life. And we're really being told to transcend all of the concepts of this human mind which we have let manipulate us through the years into a position where we're concerned about all of the things that have nothing to do with God. We're concerned about our silhouette. How does it shape up? We're concerned about our age. We're concerned about our incomes. We're concerned about our status. We're concerned about our health. God isn't concerned about any of these things. God is running a perfect universe, a perfect spiritual universe, and in it there is a perfect spiritual form that is you. And your human mind can never know this perfect spiritual you. Your human mind can never know the truth that makes you free. And that truth can only be known by the transcended consciousness which is no longer imprisoned in the human mind. Only the transcended consciousness can teach us to move and have our being in the creation of God instead of in the mental creation called this world. And so we begin to finally agree that in this human mind I am committed to a lifespan of good and evil. I am not about my father's business. I am not walking in reality. This mind is the hypnotized mind. It is not the mind of the Father. There is a mind called the mind of God. It comes as a shock to most people that God has a mind. And it comes as a greater shock to learn that the mind of God is the only mind I can ever have. And while I am not in that mind consciously, I am in a mind that the Bible calls the devil, Satan, the tempter. And I actually spend my complete human lifespan in that mind. in the Hall of Mirrors, trying to emerge from the errors that that mind is creating and always seeking to find the cause of the errors by looking into the mind which is the very cause of these errors itself. And so we walk in that circle of error, hardly even aware that the body is a product of the mind. Now along comes a great man and he says, with mind we can conquer matter. And everybody follows him like the Pied Piper was followed. Through mind we shall conquer matter. And this again is the mind in its own disguise not telling us that mind and matter are one and the same. 
Mind cannot conquer matter because mind is matter. Now we have our positive thoughts. And we find it does improve things. We are manipulating this world with right thought. And when it proves itself to be very effective up to a certain point, we think we have an answer until someone else comes along and says, well, if your positive thoughts are so good, wouldn't God's positive thoughts be even better? My thoughts are not your thoughts, says the Father. My ways are not your ways. And if you will let my thought enter your consciousness, you will perceive the nature of the miracles which the world attributed to Jesus Christ. We see that we are now in a mental universe. It had seemed to be a physical or material universe, but it is only mind made visible. The human heart is mind made visible. The human brain is mind made visible. The arm, the leg, the skin, the face, all these are the forms of matter that are mind formed. So that you find everything on the face of the earth in a material form is mind appearing as form. You don't heal a heart. You remove the mind power which produces a defective heart. You don't heal asthma. You don't heal a lung. You remove the mind which is the lung and has it captive in its false belief. You find then that you're not in a material universe, but a mental universe, and that the quality of mind determines the quality of matter. The beliefs, thoughts, concepts, conditionings of mind determine the experience of the material form. And so because matter is mind formed, a change of mind does produce a change of matter. But a change of mind only to the level of a better human mind can go no further than a better human body. and leaves the truth that brings the real freedom still untouched. As we step on our toes and become ballet dancers, alert, alive, vibrant, we become aware that around us now is the mind of God. It is everywhere. We walk through it. It is right where I have a finite mind. And my finite mind is my limited concept of that divine infinite mind which is all around me. Now, I can use this finite mind to pick up things from the atmosphere. I can pick up thoughts from the atmosphere. I can pick up suggestions. I can pick up beliefs of the world. As a matter of fact, I can't avoid doing that unless I am in the silence or in truth. And so my mind, a magnet for all of the thoughts of the world, 
reflects these thoughts in my outer experience. And all that my outer experience can be as a human being is the thoughts of the world entering my mind, converted into experience, action, belief, the various material forms that I call my life, always removed, totally separated from the activity of the infinite mind. Now as I become aware of it, as I become further aware that all evil exists only in the human mind, and its parent, the universal thought mind, I realize that dominion is possible as I learn to relinquish my beliefs, my concepts, as I learn to step out of the subtle conditioning which has shaped my mind through the environment I have lived in, through the pre-hereditary thoughts of my parents and their parents, through my education, through my experiences, and through other subtle forms of conditioning, through fear, through my anticipated goals, all of these things tend to shape and point and direct my mind toward my own self-success, self-preservation, self-attainment. And yet, in the infinite mind, none of this is necessary or possible. All the success that I could possibly seek with the human mind is a grain of sand compared to the infinite success that already exists in the Son of God. And so the bridge between the human mind and the infinite mind becomes the attainment of divine sonship into a new mind, a mind which feeds you not the bread of this world, not the thoughts of this world, but a different kind of thought by using its own mind as the channel. And then the body the human experience, the self that walks this earth, comes into the government of God. All around us now is the government of God in this one mind. We have not walked in that government because we have not been conscious of this one mind. Our five sense mind has no awareness of the one mind. It has no evidence of the one mind. It cannot touch it or feel it. It may think about it, but it cannot make the contact with it. And so this mind lets the body wither. It divorces the body from the infinite. It divorces our business from the infinite. It divorces our complete human relationships from the infinite and leaves us without a father. We become orphans in this world, separate from each other and separate from the one source. So we wither 
on the vine of time. There is a delicate place where you can make the adjustment from being this creature of the earth, unfed by the spirit, and it involves being aware that as long as you cling to the activity of your human mind, you are denying the fatherhood of God and the presence of the mind and the power of God, the presence of the one mind as your mind, and the identity of your own being as the Spirit of God. Where is this one mind? How can you let yourself into its creation? How can you transcend that which is a false witness, that which limits you to the prison of the body, that which says you must suffer both the good and the evil of this world? How can you find that mind which knows nothing of a human lifespan, of flesh that ages, of the evils of this world? That is the challenge that faces everyone in this world. Shall we be illegitimate creatures of earth or shall we accept divine sonship and the fullness of divinity flowing through us as the law of our being? Are we ready and willing to give ourselves back to God? Are we willing and ready to live in the universe of God instead of the universe of the mind of man. If your idea of freedom is to live in the creation of reality, fulfilling the will of the Father, living, moving, and having your being in spirit, fulfilling your divine destiny, enacting your divine purpose, living your divine life, being free of the obstructions and the limitations imposed by the finite mind. If that is your idea of freedom, then it is available to the degree that you will make an effort to rise out of every belief that exists in the mind with which you were born in the complete surrender of your human belief in this life, this earth, you find that there is another earth right here, another life right here, another being right here, another you right here, and it is not a mortal creature. I have had the experience of witnessing those who come into the manipulating mind which thinks that because it is a right thinker it is going to conquer this world and it doesn't. 
it gets just to the place where it produces some improvements until the bottom falls out. And its great mistake is that whereas it thought it was in right thinking, it was in mortal right thinking. We are not mortals. And as long as you have the belief that you are, then you are still in that creature body which must show forth the defects of mortality. You can never rise higher than your beliefs. And if you have not crossed out the belief in mortality, you will demonstrate mortality. You will demonstrate the good and the evil. You will demonstrate deterioration of the flesh. You will demonstrate the ultimate of mortality, which is death itself. If the belief in mortality is part of your self, then it must externalize as mortality demonstrated. When you transcend this mind, you transcend the belief in mortality. You know the meaning of the flesh profiteth nothing. You come instead into the meaning of the word made flesh. Now we must consciously take inventory of the beliefs that we have accepted in our consciousness and realize that every such belief is a seed that must be a flower tomorrow. Unless we remove the seeds of mortal belief, we're having the flowers of mortal belief in our garden the next day and the next and the next thereafter. If we do not want sickness, we cannot believe in a body that is capable of having sickness. If you believe in a human material form, you are committed to sickness and no right thinking will prevent it. If you are not committed to a spiritual form, then you are still in the human mind. If you are not committed to a life without beginning or end, you are still in the belief in mortality. If you are committed to a form that is 150 pounds, so many inches tall, with density, with bodily functions, you are not committed to the spiritual form which has no size or shape no density, no beginning and no end. You may find that your beliefs in freedom are higher than the beliefs in the world about freedom, but we still must find a higher place to go than even being superior to other human beliefs. We must look out at this world now and recognize that there is a process taking place called initiation which is going to force us to a mountaintop. Initiation is your invisible teacher. Initiation comes to you as a discord, as a problem, as a war as a loss of someone you cherish. That is your initiation. And it will keep pressuring you in many disguises and many times during your human lifespan and many times during the day and the night. It will always come in unexpected moments always to catch you napping and always to teach you one thing. There is no evil in reality. 
There is no evil in God's universe. And as long as you are in that mind which accepts the evil as a reality, you have not transcended that mind and the initiation must continue. Always, all forms of discord are training you for the only possible life that you can really live. And that is the life which knows that discord does not exist. You must have discord in your life until you reach the belief that discord does not exist. Because if you have not reached that belief, it is that belief which is the discord that you are facing. And that subtle process through which the discord in your belief externalizes as the discord that you face is part of the hypnosis that has confused the human mind all these thousands and thousands of years. This was known, for example, to Moses. His name, you may know, means to draw forth, to extract. His function was to draw forth on this earth the reality that lies behind the visible mind's experience. He was to draw forth into consciousness that which the human mind could not perceive. And he took a very strange polyglot group of Bedouin Semites out of Egypt into the Arabian desert. And he knew a truth that he couldn't teach them. He knew that only God is. He knew that only the infinite mind is. He knew that only the infinite spirit is. There was no way to reach the human mind of these men with that sublime truth. And so you find that Moses had to compromise. He had to bring his message down to the level which they could assimilate. Not that he didn't have the Christ message, he had to prepare the consciousness of the world for the Christ message. And there was one thing that Moses knew that we didn't know he knew. He knew that he wasn't dealing with people. He was dealing with human consciousness, not with form. He was dissolving human consciousness. He was dissolving mortal consciousness. He was leavening the consciousness for the appearance of the Christ realization in consciousness. And although he put all of this into his editorship of the first five chapters of the, New, of the Old Testament, it wasn't seen that Exodus was his drawing them out of the false consciousness. It wasn't seen that Adam and Eve was his painting a picture of a mental universe in which God was so deceitful that God actually went to the point of condemning his own children for doing the very things that he told them to do. He was painting the hall of mirrors of the mind of man, which has a concept of God which is not God at all. It was never recognized. But others who followed him, terminating in the great teaching of the Master Jesus, showed us that we must get out of the false Adam and Eve mind the mind that is in a creation that God did not create. Have ye that mind which was in Christ Jesus, said Paul. 
because that mind which was in Christ Jesus is the transcended mind that can look out upon the creation of reality and walk in that creation and experience the creation where there are no opposites to life to health, to perfection, to beauty, to truth. We have thought we had to wait centuries for the return of Jesus for that. And the world has been taught that when he returns, everything will be better. And we have all learned by now that the Christ within is the Christ mind. And this Christ mind becomes the Christ form of your being realized. This is the only return, the awareness of the ever-present Christ within. Now, have you ever consciously turned from your human mind with the realization that the Christ mind is omnipresent where you stand and needs only your acceptance of it before it can show you its love and its power. Have you consciously in one second relinquished your belief that your human mind is needed as a creative force as a planner, as a manipulator. Can you see that if you are still planning with that mind, you are denying the presence of the Christ mind? And yet, right where you are, only the Christ mind is. Right where you are, the infinite mind of the Father is functioning now, waiting for you to abandon your right thinking, your positive thinking, your negative thinking, your human thinking, and know that his thoughts are your thoughts the instant your mind becomes an open channel with no thought? As I take no thought, it is inevitable that instantly my mind is open to the thought of the Father. And just as we have learned that right thinking does change our material form and our material experience, now we come to the experience where divine thought entering transforms, renews, regenerates our complete material experience. Divine law becomes the law of my being. In the mind of the Father, I find a kind of freedom that is not limited to a lifespan, to a time, to a place, to an age, to a body, to an income. For now I am in the unobstructed universe. I am in the kingdom of God. I and the Father are the one mind expressing in the absence of human concept, human belief, human thought. The ways of the Father become the word and it will become the flesh of your being. The word of the Father transforms your material concept of flesh into the divine image of flesh.
we are no longer confined to our own limited thought forms, to our limited sense of employment, to our limited sense of supply, to our limited sense of happiness, to our limited sense of purpose. Our infinite individuality becomes the way of the Father in us expressing. We are not living by bread alone. We are coming into a new complete government which is independent of man on earth. Independent of man whose breath is in his nostrils. Independent of the virus. Independent of human powers. Independent of every form of human iniquity independent of disease, independent of age, independent of matter, independent of bombs or bullets. Why? Because when we are not in thought, Christ is formed in us. And divine sonship is realized. we become a true witness of reality. The experience of resting in the mind of God is somewhat like a flower receiving rain. You are blessed by this great force and the miracle of it is that the mind of the Father does exactly what your human mind had tried to do but couldn't do. Your human mind externalized your experiences. Now the mind of the Father does the same. But the mind of the Father externalized where you stand becomes a miracle. It's the miracle of harmony made manifest. It's the miracle of grace. It's the miracle of loaves and fishes falling out of the sky. It's the miracle of a cloud by day and a pillar of fire by night. Divine mind externalized is the fulfillment of the Father's statement that all that I have is thine. You walk literally in the kingdom of heaven on earth because divine mind is that kingdom made manifest. Now if we were to try to straighten our backs fill our empty pocketbooks, remove a pain, or do any of the things that we call human problems, we find that humanly there are different methods for each one. Spiritually, there's one method. Transcend mind. Transcend mind to the place where divine mind is the only mind and it cannot externalize as arthritis or a toothache or an empty bank book it cannot even externalize as death divine mind can only externalize as divine experience and so whoever has been touched sufficiently by the spirit to know that the experience of divine mind is not only possible but inevitable that individual is going to practice the awareness of the infinite mind 
You might, for example, do it this way. You have a problem in your family. Alerted, you would know that you don't have a problem in your family, you have a problem in your mind. And now you don't have to worry about the problem in the family, you have to worry about the mind which is misperceiving the all-presence of the Father. Only spirit is here, and you may think this problem in your family is in your daughter, in your husband, in your wife, in yourself, in your children, in your parents, but it isn't. It is always in the human mind. <coughs> now let's stay in that human mind for a moment and see that whatever is in the human mind must externalize. And therefore, unless we get it out of the human mind, it's going to show forth as a continuation of the problem. But at this moment, all we're doing is dwelling in a human mind which is the denial of the presence of the divine mind. And so pause a minute now. Learn how to turn from this human belief of the problem to the divine mind which is right where you are, ever present. Ask it. Accept it and ask it to redefine the truth for you. That's all. Step out of your human mind and rest in the divine, waiting for it to redefine reality. And you will discover that you have transcended the appearance of this problem. There will come a place in consciousness where the infinite mind does something that happened way back to Elijah. When the widow said, here, my son is dead. Give me your son, he said. And he took that child and he went up to his room. And in his room, he lay upon that child and tried to breathe into it. And he said, I can't believe, Father, that you could do this. How could God inflict death upon a child. And in his realization that God couldn't do it, something clicked in him. If God couldn't do it, how could it be done? Who has the power to do what God cannot do? And he came back to the woman and said, here's your child, he lives. The realization that God cannot cause a problem should tell you that if God cannot cause it, there is no cause for it. The only cause on this earth, as it is in heaven, is God. And if there's no cause for the problem, because God did not cause it, it is merely a figment of the imagination of the universal thought which you are accepting in your individual human mind and transcending that human mind accepting God's mind as present you break the whole circuit of world thought we see it happen quite frequently where things that are so real to this human mind vanish because that's the only place where they existed and in the moment that that human mind is lifted out of itself into be, being a receiver for the divine it shows forth the divine image as the absence of the very problem that it had striven to overcome I would say the key to this is the understanding that you cannot be anywhere where divine mind is not. The little grain of sand called human mind removed 
leaves you in the complete fullness of divine mind and unfettered form. You might practice this little transition from the human to the divine mind for brief periods in which you consciously become aware that I have never known the divine mind was right here because I had no faculty with which to perceive it. In my five senses, I could not become aware of this divine mind. But now I am becoming aware through those who have gone before me, who reveal the power of the divine mind. Who relinquish their human concept, knowing divine mind can only function perfectly, and miracles appeared from the sky and on the earth. Bones were reset, eyes could see, ears could hear. Why? Only because the human mind was removed. And in its place came the infinite mind, which had ever been there. but veiled by the thought of the individual thinking human mind. It really is a shock to learn that the divine mind is here and we, in our ignorance, in our self-will, in our self-determination, have not been taught to rest in that divine mind so that we can be directed, guided, fed, sustained, lifted, and given life by this divine mind which is the Father and the law and the activity of its creation. This is a conscious thing that you do. If you were meditating at five or six in the morning, or twelve, one a.m., two a.m., when the world is asleep, and preferably at a time when you too are not deep in human thought, you would find a great stillness in which you would become aware that all that exists is divine consciousness. Divine consciousness is the infinite self and within itself is its own creation and there is nothing else. And you would surrender to that infinite stillness knowing that I am the spiritual self which this infinite stillness is. There is no gap, no separation, no division. All that this infinite stillness is, I am. And if you've ever experienced bliss, it would be something like knowing that right at this moment, all that I am is filled to the capacity of my being as the infinite is flowing, pouring, expressing itself within me. And that infinite will continue to express in expanding mansions in a continuous progression. This awareness of the limitless nature of the infinite expressing in you is comparable to the word bliss. To know that in this moment of one there is no other on the face of the earth and I am united with all who walk the earth 
in this moment of one. For I am united with the Father. It is only in this moment of one that the individual minds of the world cease to be a power over you. And you even escape the tyranny of your own human mind. In this second, when you know the infinite mind is where you are, When you become selfless and yet the one self, you've crossed the barrier of the human mind. You're now living by the word. And that is the meaning of, in my flesh shall I know God. Even in my flesh shall I see him. Whereas I was blind in the human mind, now, as the infinite is the only mind, my mind, now I see. Never can the spiritual forms of the Father be deficient in any way. Never can the Father be blind or deaf. Never can the spiritual form be blind or deaf. Never can the functions of the spirit, spiritual form deteriorate. Never can the faculties of the spiritual form become less than perfect. And only in the transcended mind can you experience the perfection of these forms. The transcended mind is the mind of no thought. The mind that has risen from the hypnosis of the belief that through my human thought I can make this a better world for myself. The mind that has risen out of its own trap. The mind that no longer veils the truth that makes you free. Is the mind of God. The mind that was in Christ Jesus. And that mind walks in the unconditioned universe of reality. For these few moments, we have given the universe back to God. We have said, I know you're running a perfect universe, and there's no need for me to intervene and try to run my little universe within your infinite universe. I recognize that everything on this earth that has happened to me is pushing me now to that mountaintop where I can smile and say to the discords, you don't fool me one bit. There is no discord in God. And therefore this discord must be in me. It is an outer picture of my inner discord. I must face this fact that my superstitions, my resentments, my anger, my jealousies, my greed, my selfishness, 
This is what becomes my outer discords. And I have picked these things up from world belief. And no longer will I continue to move in that circle of error. I shall transcend human thought. And then we're no longer in the fall from the divine consciousness. Now the form must follow the rejuvenated, regenerated mind. For always the matter of this form is the fabric of my mind. And if my mind is spiritualized, lifted, released into the divine, then the matter of this form will reflect that new birth. And I will walk in the new earth right here. Every healing that ever takes place in your life, whether it's in you or someone you've worked for, every healing spiritually is a change of minds from the human to the divine. And in that change of minds, the bridegroom cometh. There is an inner marriage with the truth which externalizes as the improved condition. Whether it's business or marriage or body or whatever the problem had been. There's one little secret that has come to me that I'd like to share with you. It's a very subtle one. And it's for those of you who are doing healing for others. You will discover that someone phones you and asks you for some help. Now when that happens, what has really happened is this. The universal false mind has put into that individual who has called you a problem. And that universal false mind continues to you and phones you to tell you that there is a problem in your friend. It isn't spirit awakening you. It is the same universal false mind which put the problem in your friend, now calls you up and says, See, Mary has a problem. Help her. So it has it is hit your friend and now it's coming to you to tell you to help her. And your function at that point is to get into the infinite mind. Otherwise, it's going to use the evidence that Mary is sick to persuade you that such a condition exists. And it doesn't. It only exists in that mind which has com come to you announcing the problem. And so the moment you face it, as if to say to it, well, look, I know who you are. You're the fellow who's causing all the trouble. And you're telling me Mary is sick, as you've told her, and I'm stopping you right here. As soon as you break the continuity of that mind which is announcing to you the sickness, you're going to help break it for Mary. It's going to stop in its tracks where you stand in the truth. If it's going to say to you that Mary is dying and you're going to accept that, then you're just delaying the time when you're in Mary's problem yourself. Because Mary can never die. 
Mary can never be sick. There can never be evil in reality. There can never be discord in reality. And when you are aware that all discord occurs in the human mind and nowhere else, you'll see why this chapter is titled Transcending Mind. Because it's really saying transcending error, transcending discord, transcending death, transcending everything that is unlike God. From Joel's chapter, mind is the substance of every form of sin, disease, death, false appetite, lack, limitation, wars, rumors of wars, and all the other things listed under the word evil. Every problem that we can possibly face in this world is a product of mind. And mind thinks. And therefore the thought of that mind is the source of the problem. And so as we rest in the thought of our mind, even though we are convinced that we are pure and good and well-meaning, The thought of our mind contains world thought. And that world thought in the thought of our mind externalizes as the evils of our experience. This should be very clear to all of us. And then the solution to it becomes clear. We must come over world thought which functions in us. We must come over the subconscious, the unconscious, and the conscious thought of our own mind. Because mind is the father of the evils of our world. Whatever you're suffering from is not what it appears to be. It isn't a bad heart. It's something, some thought in mind which to you is a bad heart. It isn't a tumor on the brain. It's some thought in mind which is manifesting as a tumor. And it isn't a thought about a tumor. It is the belief that a tumor can be which has not been crossed out in your consciousness. It is the belief that a heart can falter which has not been crossed out in your consciousness. You may not even consciously have had the thought, but in the acceptance of a human heart, of a human brain, you are subject to the material laws of a human brain and a human heart. Human thought is about human things. Divine thought is not about a human heart, is not about a human brain. Divine thought never enters into a human thought about a human thing. And therefore, in divine thought, there can never be a tumor in a human brain. Divine thought knows nothing about the human brain. Divine thought can never have a faltering heart because it knows nothing about a heart to begin with. 
And we learn to make this mind an instrument for the divine. So that divine thought flows through this mind. And in divine thought, there is nothing about a heart or a brain or a liver or a lung or a material thing. And so we don't have good matter in divine thought or bad matter. We don't have matter. And that becomes your unconscious thought, your subconscious thought, and your conscious thought. Only divine thought moving through you manifests as divine form. Now Isaiah said it this way, because my thoughts are not your thoughts. And remember when Isaiah speaks, this is the voice of God speaking through the prophet. And the voice of God is saying, for my thoughts are not your thoughts. Neither are your ways my ways, saith the Lord. For as the heavens are higher than the earth, so are my ways higher than your ways, and my thoughts than your thoughts. For as the rain cometh down in the snow from heaven, and returneth not thither, but watereth the earth, and maketh it bring forth, and bud, that it may give seed to the sower and bread to the eater, so shall my word be that goeth forth out of my mouth. It shall not re return unto me void, but it shall accomplish that which I please, and it shall prosper on the thing whereunto I sent it. And so the power of divine thought in you must fulfill its idea in you. It cannot return void. It must perform that which it starts to perform in you. And its performance in you is the perfection of that divine thought. Just as human thought in you performs as both good and evil, Divine thought in you performs only in the perfection of the divine. Now we go back to Joel and see how he phrases this so that you see this chapter is a very crucial point in our spiritual history. The original. The basic creative principle and the substance of life is God, soul, consciousness. But mind is the instrument through which God's activity takes place because properly understood and utilized, mind is an instrument of God. When the mind is open, to receive the divine impulse, then harmonious, perfect form flows out from it. And so Joel has taught that mind, imbued with divine truth, becomes the law of harmony unto itself and its externalization called matter. When you take the time to turn away from the thoughts of this world which flow consciously and unconsciously through your mind and to fill your mind with the truth about the reality of God, the allness of God, the presence of God, rejecting every opposite that is unlike God, this truth in you is the purification, the preparation of the mind to become a perfect instrument for the divine. And then, as you remember, this camera that is photographing your thoughts 
only has divine thought to photograph and that's all it can manifest. When we were promised dominion in Genesis, it was that dominion which is the dominion of the divine mind functioning in us. Your dominion over land, sea and air includes dominion over this body, includes dominion over all material things and conditions. But it is not a dominion which uses power for self-glory. It is rather the immunity to the false powers of the world. It isn't something you use, it is something you let use you. Meek unto the Father, we inherit this earth. Now when you have transcended mind for a moment, a second, a day, an hour, the next question is how do I stay there? And there are no shortcuts. We don't transcend mind to have an experience or a sensation or just to get rid of a bump. We transcend mind that we may walk this earth as a son of spirit in our rightful place, in our rightful body, in our rightful mind, in our rightful life. It is only then that the words eternal, infinite, and immortal begin to mean something. They mean nothing to a human being. The freedom we talk about as a human being has nothing to do with being immortal. But in reality, the only freedom we know is eternality, immortality, infinity. We learn that infinity is the only reality there is. Anything that is finite is not real. And because only reality exists, we are that living infinity ourselves. And we do not accept the outer fraction which poses as us. When you were given a name, You may not know at the time, but you picked your own name. Your parents didn't give it to you. They believe they did. But just as Mary was given the name Jesus from within, so were your parents given your name. You picked it. You picked it because you were a living consciousness and you were identifying yourself. And when you came forth and someone said, this is what we'll call this child, they did not know that they were not naming a child. They were putting a name on a consciousness because that's all that was there, a consciousness. And that's all that is there now, a consciousness. And your name is not the name of your body, it is the name of your consciousness. And that consciousness is pushing forth that which is called the form. That consciousness is bringing into visibility that which is called the conditions of that form and the experiences of that form. And that name of that consciousness will change someday. It will be given another name because that consciousness, which is you, which is not this form, but which is your name, your reality, 
that consciousness is still changing to receive more and more of its own divinity. And when it receives its divinity, it is dissolved as this name, and its new name is Christ. When it becomes Christ consciousness, then it becomes another form out here. The Christ consciousness now transforms this form and its experiences and Christ is risen in you. We transcend mind that we may transcend the false physical limited self which we were forced to accept because there was no one to tell us that God is the only being. That spirit is the only substance. And that we are that substance. Truth in consciousness is your protector against the thoughts of the world. Truth in consciousness ultimately out pictures as truth in experience, purifying this mind still further, ultimately making it a perfect channel for the divine. And then Christ formed in you is divine thought manifesting invisibly as your spiritual self. That's why we transcend mind that Christ may be formed in us. For when you walk in the Christ, then all conditions of the flesh cease to be. And in your flesh you know God. I'd like to recommend that you reread this chapter, bringing to it the awareness as you read the chapter that the mind of God wrote the chapter and that the mind of God in you is reading the chapter that no other mind is present. And I believe you'll find that you're not living in the effects of a human mind while you're doing it. That's what we do out here. We live in the effects of the human mind and the judgments about those effects, pyramiding one error upon the other. Now let us see everyone in their divine image not by looking at them with a human mind but by resting in that mind which can redefine the reality of everyone around you. If you were left to your human mind you wouldn't try very hard to find the divinity in others. This human mind is too hard-pressed trying to live its own life to be concerned about finding the divinity in others. And if we don't transcend this human mind, we'll never look for the divinity in others. We'll always live within this finite material sense of self. It's only when you allow yourself to look for the divinity in others and find you cannot do it with your human mind that you release the activity of the divine and lo and behold this becomes your expanded consciousness. Ultimately you're going to find that the Christ you recognize in your neighbor
is the very reason that you have been able to come up above a limited concept of yourself. And now you're coming further out into the realization of one life, one being, one self, as much yourself 500 miles away as where your body seems to be standing now. (coughs) We're coming out of our personal concepts of things. We're lifting the veil of our own blindness. We're not shortening God's arm. We're recognizing that there is one self on this earth, and it is I. We're removing the mask of a limited human mind here and there and everywhere and not accepting the beliefs of another human mind as well as my own human mind but lifting the mask of all human minds to rest, to bask in that present perfection until you feel it until you witness it in the inner and then manifest it in the outer. If you can feel the Christ of your neighbor through resting in the infinite mind, you're on your way to real illumination. Your expanded consciousness is going to find the spirit in a flower, the spirit in a tree, the spirit in everything that walks this earth because you won't be looking through double vision through a divided consciousness now the single eye the undivided consciousness of the one infinite mind must witness itself in all that you do you're transcending your human sense of being And the core of that human sense of being is the limited human mind. You might make a few experiments. We have one woman who received a plant from a friend And within two or three days, the leaves and blossoms all fell off. And so she called a florist and they sent another one. But something prompted her to keep the one in which all the blossoms fell off. And within two or three days, in her realization that God doesn't make mistakes, that only spirit is present, that only spiritual form can be present. She began to witness new blossoms within three days on the dead branches that really weren't dead at all. Her tree was having, her little bush was having a resurrection. And the beauty of it was that all of this was new to her within the past nine months. And experience after experience is making her open up to a life within herself that she didn't know was there, which is capable of transforming the deadness of this world into the reality of life. Oh, that's just one incident. But everywhere it's happening, in some places slower than others, but happening. That which appears to be dead is being revealed as impossible because life has no opposite. Only life exists. And we're learning that. And we're expecting it to show itself. Our belief is that life has no opposite. And that belief manifests as the blossom on a tree or the blossom on a bush 
as the color in a cheek that was pale, as the movement of an arm where there was only paralysis. Life has no opposite. And in that belief, which is not the belief of a human mind, you are accepting the infinite omnipotence of the divine mind. You are purifying. You are expanding. And it will demonstrate itself through you as truth in consciousness made externally manifest. Perhaps as loaves and fishes in the sky, gold in a fish's mouth, fishes in the nets where there were no fishes before. Always this is divine mind externalized. Christ mind made visible. And it is effortless. It is never channeled by a human mind. It is merely an appearance brought forth by the divine mind which infallibly meets every need at the precise necessary moment in the precise necessary way. The way to grace is through the transcending of the human thought, of the human mind. The next chapter is the unconditioned universe. And I believe it's a very short one, so you ought to be able to reread the one we just did, because we go over these things a little too fast. As you reread it, get yourself set up for the next and then do the next, you'll find they make a perfect unit. The transcending of this mind brings you into the unconditioned mind. And then you drop the belief in conditions in order for the unconditioned universe to manifest through your unconditioned mind. Thank you very much.